Audio's good. It's on. I'm going to talk about, um, I'll first give a bit of an introduction, talk about some tips when installing GDoll, how to use it with Python, some random tips, um, and then a bit about how to use these uh, cloud-optimized and how to make cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs, and uh, also where to go for some help. Um, so, as a quick introduction about myself, I'm the team lead for the Data Pipeline team in Berlin for Plant Labs Germany. Uh, I've been there since 2014 working for Blackbridge and we were acquired by Planet. Um, I am Belgian, but I was raised in Florida, so that explains the accent a bit. Um, this is my fourth year attending FOSTEM and the first time speaking. So, a bit about GDAL. Who here has used GDAL or is using GDAL already? All right, good. Um, so I'll just quickly go over this. So um, GDAL is the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library. Uh, it was initially created by Frank Warmerdam. He's actually my colleague back in San Francisco. Um, the project is now managed by OSGEO. Um, it's a C++ C++ library. Um, can read a whole bunch of vector, so shapes, and raster or image formats. Um, there's a whole bunch, over 150 rasters and 90 vector formats. It's, as you heard, it's kind of like the base of um, everything that, like basically every uh, geospatial project uses this internally. Um, so some of the like, most common GDAL utilities are like GDAL warp for if you're like doing mosaicing, reprojection, and warping. Uh, GDAL translate to change from one raster format to another. And then the vector equivalent of OGR to OGR. And then GDAL info where you know, you can not just get the information, but you can also generate a whole bunch of statistics out of that and get it in a whole bunch of different formats. So in on the installation side, on Mac it's pretty easy. Um, there's a, if you use Homebrew, which you should, um, there's the OSGO for Mac um, tap that you can use. Um, it's also managed by OSGO, and uh, they're always looking for some help there. Um, and then you just install the GDAL2 and GDAL2 Python bindings. On Ubuntu, um, there's a Ubuntu GAS PPA um, that has GDAL there, but there's also a cross-platform way of doing this. So if you're already using Anaconda, um, you basically just kind of install with uh, GDAL, and that kind of like sets up a lot of the um, dependencies that you need there. But I don't really recommend doing either of those because um, you get a lot of dependency problems. So Planet, we use a lot of VMs and containers to isolate all the system dependencies to basically make it um, so you can just rebuild the whole system and get back to a working configuration. You don't have to worry about like upgrading something for some other package that you might be using and breaking your whole GDAL installation. And it also kind of lets you avoid having to use the Python virtual end, um, where you also get some problems if you're trying to do like multiple versions of GDAL in different virtual environments. That just gets very messy. Um, and basically, you can just put the setup instructions in Dockerfile or Vagrant file or use an existing uh, setup to kind of get started and then just build up there with whatever dependencies you might need. So working in Python. Um, GDAL2 gave us a lot of powerful uh, Python bindings. So um, you don't need to use the command line call anymore. You can just basically put the command line arguments in uh, the Python call to GDAL warp, for instance. Um, and there's also, um, I, I was reading a bit about this, that the OGR to OGR, for instance, is not called OGR to OGR in the Python bindings, but is GDAL vector translate. Uh, there's a whole RFC about how this was set up, um, but yeah, it makes it a lot easier to have that, and you don't have to worry about the whole sub-process call. 
Also, there's a very good NumPy integration. So um, if you are doing things like windowing, you can actually just uh, read the array and specify the offset that you want, and then you get a whole NumPy array. You can do all the vector and, uh, sorry, all the raster computations that way as well. Um, also, if you are just kind of trying to do some small things, you don't actually have to use the GDAL Python bindings directly. Um, there's a few good libraries that um, we use as well. Uh, Rasterio or Raster.io from Mapbox. Um, it's basically a Pythonic version of GDAL. Um, so it's all GDAL under the hood, but it's basically just a Python API that's Pythonic. Um, and it's a lot easier to use when you're um, wanting to open. You can uh, do a lot with that. For vectors um, and shapes, um, Shapely and Fiona from the same person. Um, it's also Pythonic. Um, Shapely only has a Geos dependency, if I remember correctly. And then Fiona has the full GDAL OGR dependency. Um, and of course, they're also a lot easier to use. You can load GeoJSONs and WKTs and all this stuff and do your um, validation and intersection area calculation and all these uh, other transformations. So some other tips. Um, what I really recommend is that if you are um, wanting to learn a lot more how to use GDAL, especially like the um, C++ API, there's a lot of the utilities that are some of them that I mentioned in the previous slides that um, you can just read their source code, try to understand how they work, and then that gives that's basically a bit better than the documentation on how to use things, especially if you're looking at GDAL warp. Um, that shows you how to actually do all the things that it does under the hood, um, as well as there are some of them that are Python scripts. So uh, the GDAL calc, for instance, it's GDAL calc.py. Um, that does all the loading into the NumPy array and does the, um, for instance, if you want to do like a, a difference, then you can just look at how it um, extracts the operations and executes them. Um, so that's basically my first tip on that. Um, also, if you're working with geometries that you get from random places or that you're generating. Uh, sometimes, especially around the dateline, you get some weird uh, issues where they, the geometry doesn't validate anymore. And basically, you can just apply a zero buffer on it. And then that um, OGR kind of magically makes it a valid geometry. So um, really helpful whenever you're having weird problems with uh, geometries, just apply a buffer to it with Actually, no buffer, but that makes it work. Um, there's also VRTs. So VRTs are virtual data sets. And um, you can basically treat a whole bunch of um, imagery tiles as like one big image. Um, you can also basically take a big image and chunk it up into smaller files and then join it all back together in this VRT, which just references all the images and where they should be in if they were one raster. <coughs> oh, sorry, screensaver. Yeah, so um, VRTs are just basically XML files um, that describe all the operations. Um, and they do need everything to be in one common projection. So just keep that in mind if you are trying to do that. The other uh, really cool thing is that um, a lot of imagery providers are now making cloud-optimized geotiffs. So uh, what's cloud-optimized geotiffs? So these are geotiffs that um, work a lot better for cloud processing. So um, essentially what they do is they um, have like the header information in the very beginning, and um, it's uh, tiled image, so usually 256 by 256 or 512 by 512 tiles. And they also have all the overviews built in. <coughs> Sorry. By doing this, we you can essentially just do a, a range request, so you can get the header, or GDAL can basically get the header, 
and then um, figure out what byte range the um, imagery that you need if you're doing a window or where the overviews are if you're just getting some um, if you just need the overview of the image and then um, it downloads only the data that it actually needs so um, if you're using the VSI curl driver in GDAL you can basically just put the URL in there and of the image um, if you're getting it from Open Aerial Map, Digital Globe, Planet, um, the Landsat 8 bucket on AWS is also in this format. And there's a whole bunch more. Um, COGO.org has like a lot more information about this. But it can really save on the download times and not having to download the whole raster just to get the small piece that you need. <coughs> if you're generating image and you want this to be in the cloud optimized geotiff format, there's basically two things that you need to do. Um, if you don't already have overviews built, then you would just uh, use GDAL add O, add overviews, um, to build the overviews. So basically, just put your image where it says in.tiff and um, run this. It should be pretty quick. Um, and that actually modifies the image and puts it in directly. Um, if you are doing an external overview, it's not going to work. Um, the second thing is to then do GDAL translate, where you basically tell it that you want it to be tiled, and you want to copy the overviews that were in there, and then um, this recommends to use LZW compression. Um, you can also use deflate, but there's some issues. Some, some things aren't fully compatible with deflate. Um, and, and the other important thing is that if you're, when you're hosting it, uh, the server needs to support the range request, so HTTP 1.1. Uh, if, if you're just putting it on S3 or Google Cloud or Azure, they all support this uh, byte serving, as it's also called. To use a cloud optimized UATIF, um, basically if you're using the VSI curl driver, that's all under the hood, handled magically. Um, some examples are on the GDAL wiki. Um, there's also um, a good, basically, Jupyter notebook that describes that, and it's linked here. Uh, I also have the presentation uploaded on the FOSTEM website, so um, if you look up the page for this presentation, you'll see the um, presentation link there as a PDF. Um, so here's an example of using the VSI curl driver. As you can see, it's basically just doing the uh, slash VSI curl slash the URL. Uh, so this one is a Landsat 8 image on the Landsat um, AWS bucket, which is a great uh, open data source if you want to start playing around with raster and need some imagery. So uh, where to get help? Uh, this is also a very important topic, but um, the GIS Stack Exchange, which I think I saw a shirt there, um, that's a really good place. Um, you'll find a lot of people um, from the development community. Frank and I both uh, answer questions on there. And there's a GDAL IRC channel as well. And um, the GDAL dev mailing list uh, is a great way to get answers. GDAL.org, the main website, has um, you know the wiki and everything else, so you can really get like all the documentation on there. But um, another great resource is um, there's a series of medium posts by a colleague Rob Simmon, where he goes over really introduction to GDAL, um, you know, a bit of, about the history of projections and whatnot. Uh, so it's a really good read. It's like three part series. Um, there's also the Python GDAL OGR cookbook. Um, I've used it quite a lot when starting out with GDAL to figure out how to do things in Python. Um, doing that and the uh, reading the GDAL utility code as well. Um, those two things were important. And um, I also made one of these awesome geospatial lists um, on GitHub. So a uh, bit of shameless self-promotion of that there. And um, yeah, so basically, um, these people helped out with the presentation, mostly uh, some of my colleagues and 
um, Evan, who's basically one of the uh, main developers of GDAL now. And um, all the imagery here is from my company, so uh, all the beautiful pictures you saw on the slides. Um, the, uh, we also have an open data set over California, so it's uh, Creative Commons license imagery from like two weeks ago or something like that. Or um, You can basically just uh, go on the Planet website and make an account and uh, get some data if you want to have some more uh, free data sets that you want to use for your stuff. And that's it. This picture of my cat. And uh, thank you. Um, and you can reach me on Twitter, GitHub. Um, you can send me an email. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I have a question. Yes. No, this has been supported in GDAL for a while, actually. Um, so the cloud-optimized geotiffs are nothing really new. Um, the, it's more like leveraging existing uh, features of GDAL in kind of like a bit more standardized way. So. <coughs> yes. So um, the question is, when you have all these different libraries and you, um, uh, they all recommend to use Docker, but they have their own Docker containers and you want to basically put them together. <coughs> um, we kind of have had the similar problem of doing that. Um, we rely heavily on GDAL, but of course there's other libraries that you need to use. And basically one of the things you can do is to kind of try to glue these different uh, Docker files together. So um, to like look into it and build it that way. Um, we also rely heavily on VMs at Planet, and so basically we have like a big script that you know as you start trying to integrate these different projects, you kind of build up a VM, and if you start going down a really weird path, then you can kind of still recreate the whole VM back out. So it is a lot of work, unfortunately, but um, yeah, the the VM makes it really like sure that like you can always back out and kind of start over and that's kind of like your source of truth if it works on the fresh vm then um you just use that but if you're like doing something weird then you can yeah yeah I don't think QGIS fully supports it yet. Um, I think in QGIS 3, which should be released sometime soon, um, they will have some of that support. But yeah, it's not fully supporting QGIS yet. So the question was, um, are cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs supporting QGIS? Correct. Yeah, you could. Once it's supported, then basically it, it's streaming the data. Right. And especially if you're viewing it at a high zoom level, for instance, it'll just use the overviews instead of downloading the full raster. Any other questions? All right, thank you.